Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel, my friends. Today, we are watching Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode 12, The Menagerie, part two. We've already watched part one, and again, there was a lot of elements from the unaired pilot, The Cage, that footage that was shown. Um, it's not so much about that. It's about those events from The Cage and how they affect our current crew of the Enterprise in both The Menagerie and The Menagerie Part 2. Very, very interested to see how this all plays out and see what the resolution is, because right now it's not looking so great for Spock. Um, when you steal a Starfleet ship, they tend to not like that very much, and it looks like he's uh, he's up to it about here. And um, with the death penalty kind of in play for going to the Talos star system, which he has rigged the Enterprise to do, the stakes are very high, my friends. But before we go on, if you could hit that like button and smash that subscribe, ring that bell for notifications, you'll be alerted anytime we go live here on YouTube for any Star Trek, sci-fi, or anything like that. And my friends, again, if you'd like it early, the link to the Patreon is in the description. We would love to have you. But my friends, all that is then. This is now as we conclude our first two, my first two-parter in Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode 12, The Menagerie, part two. Prepare to engage maximum warp reaction. And away we go. Look at that beauty. I find it hard to believe the events of the past 24 hours. Or the plea of Mr. Spock. Cool shot. How do you plead to the charge of unlawfully taking command of this starship? Guilty. There before our eyes actual images from 13 years ago of Captain Pike as he was when he commanded this vessel of Spock in those days and of how the Enterprise had become the first and only starship to visit Talos IV. Must have been mind-blowing to watch this live. It was all a trap set by a race of beings who could make a man believe he was seeing anything they wished him to see. Dart gun! Dart gun! Now, they said these transmissions were coming from Talos Force. Yeah. Mr. Spock, you're aware of the orders regarding any contact with Talos IV. You have deliberately invited the death penalty. Why was this assumed, though? I understand staying out of the sector for the Talosian's benefit. It's your career and Captain Pike's life. You must see the rest of the transmission. Crazy. I mean, these are high stakes. Okay, so Jim's going to tell us about space, it being the final frontier and all. So... A couple things that I'm looking for, and again, this is a, a restating from the things that we went over uh, on Menagerie Part 1. How do they, I understand why Spock is bringing him here. If you, Vina had a similar problem, a crippled body, but was the illusory and everything like that, was able to make her young and healthy and whole. I'm, I'm assuming that's what Spock is trying to do, getting back to the Telosians, and even if it's not real... Pike could be up and moving around or at least feel in this illusory capability that he was back to being himself. I have a feeling the shot that they're going to use at the end of this is the one where like in the cage, it was a fake Pike that was going off with Vina. But are there any more messages, any more communications, any more dialogues? Let's see. The Menagerie, part two. Starfleet has ordered no contact with Talos IV. They made no exceptions. The Keeper has taken over control of our screen. Do you understand, sir? Yeah, Pike's the only one that would really understand that. So this is how we get information from inside the Telosian HQ. The Telosians are sending all this stuff. And they had that whole place. I mean, now again, these could be like telepathy-driven recordings, you know? I'm with it. I can buy it. Twinkle, 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 twinkle. And still love the, the bulging flexing of the veinage. My name is Christopher Pike, commander of the space vehicle Enterprise from a stellar group at the other end of this galaxy. Our intentions are peaceful. For now. <laughs> You're not speaking, yet I can hear you. You will note the confusion as it reads our thought transmissions. Are these the same voice acting? We can soon begin the experiment. They change these messages, or the, the dialogue, I think. Engineering deck will rig the transmit ship's power. We'll try blasting through that metal. There we go. We kept it in. Thank goodness. Thousands of us are already probing the creature's thoughts, Magistrate. These are different dialogue options. Starting just as it happened two weeks ago. <laughs> I 
wonder if they shot additional footage for this. He would see, taste, suffer with the same reality as you gentlemen sitting there. Quick. So he rips this door right off its hinges, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Fuck that door! It doesn't matter what you call this. You'll feel it. That's what matters. You'll feel every moment of what happens to you. I want to see these are different dialogue uh, options here. Get your plus two. Get your plus two, Chris. Plus two AC. Chris says, you know what? I think you're an illusion anyway, so I'm just going to throw this. Oh. Jesus, that must be so hard. They want him back. Alive, sir. I demand to know why. If you'll be patient, sir, the answers to your question. You're forgetting you're on trial, Spock. You will answer all questions put to you. They're going to fix him. They're going to try their best. Obviously, there's a lot from the cage in here. A ton. But why wouldn't you use this footage? It's great shit. From the mysterious planet now only one hour ahead of us. The story of Captain Pike's imprisonment there. Feel with me, too. You can have whatever dream you want. Somebody had a great comment for the cage and said the Telosians were the original people that made reaction videos. They love watching all this other stuff through, you know, vicariously through Pike and Vina and stuff. And they reacted on it. I think it's hilarious. It's great. Great observation. <laughs> Meanwhile, they are wrecking shit on the top of that building or the top of that mountain that they just can't see. I love when they come up at the end and the whole top's gone. I like that cannon. What if they ever use it again? The top of that knoll should have been sheared off the first second. Oh, it was. <laughs> it's what I tried to explain in the briefing room. Their power of illusion is so great we can't be sure of anything we do. Yeah. Anything we see. Voice was absolutely correct. A whole collection of specimens, descendants of life brought back long ago from all over this part of the galaxy. Which means they had to have more than one of each animal. This is new dialogue. I don't remember this. You said you weren't real, remember? And she said she was as real as you wish. <laughs> These are changes. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to go back and look at this because I, I remember those conversations being different. An earth woman. Then you were captured as breeding stock. He made that leap after all that, though. You overlook the unpleasant alternative of punishment. That's where they throw him in hell. Dear God. I will maintain the strongest glass ever. From deeper in your mind, there are things even more unpleasant. I can't wait to do Q&A because I, I'm convinced, I, at least I've convinced myself, that there is different dialogue being delivered here. Not, not crazy different, but, but definitely manipulated for this episode. With the female now properly conditioned. You mean properly punished? I'm the one who's not cooperating. Why don't you punish me? Now, this, this was an original exchange. I don't know if they're just showing us more of the conversation or this is added dialogue. <laughs> Quite a place you have here, Mr. Pike. Nice place you have here, Mr. Pike. Nice place you have here, Mr. Pike. They're like animals. Vicious, seductive. They say no human male can resist them. Jim's like, hold my beer. This is... a, a much longer shot. That's my cue for pooping. I think you just blasted a hole in that window and you're keeping us from seeing it. You want me to test my theory out on your head? No, no, no. No, 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 no. You were right. It seems the Telosians have deserted you. Gentlemen, a moment, please. Here comes their request. May I have your verdict? A signal you want them to wait. Captain, please. It's your life now. At least a chance for life. Keep talking about life, Mr. Spock. A chance for life. How? It's a prisoner? Caged, a zoo specimen, living the illusions that amuse his keepers. No, Captain. There's more to it. Watch. Guilty, yes or no, Captain? Yes. 
I must also vote guilty as charged. And you, Captain? What are you going to do, Jim? Guilty. As yeah. charged. As it stands right now, there's very little that you can go on. No, I mean, if they're going to switch this up a little bit and make it like the Telosians can actually fix people, they're not going to want to share that information because everybody would be showing up to have them help. I said it once during the cage, I'll say it again now during the Menagerie Part 2. Uh, the doors is what would take me out. Hearing that twinkle shit all the time, that'd be the end of it. And there's the top, blasted to shit by the cannon that they couldn't see. Their method of storing records is crude and consumed much time. Are you prepared to assimilate it? Allow my head veins to pump while I think. Thinking, 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 head veins are pumping. The customs and history of your race show a unique hatred of captivity. Uh, yeah. Your unsuitability has condemned the Telosian race to eventual death. Is this not sufficient? I see. But wouldn't some form of trade, mutual cooperation? Your race would learn our power of illusion and destroy itself too. I mean, try to keep the look of disgust off, disgust off your face, Chris. He found me in the wreckage, dying. Lump of flesh. Oh, God. They rebuilt me. Everything works. But they had never seen a human. They had no guide for putting me back together. It's one of the more horrible things ever said in Star Trek so far that I've experienced. They tried. They just didn't know humans, but they tried. It was necessary to convince you her desire to stay is an honest one. You'll give her back her illusion of beauty. And more. Now, curiously enough, I want to see, they have a shot where Pike leaves and walks off with, there's an illusory Pike that walks off with Vina, and they're going to use that as the end shot whenever they bring chair-bound Pike back. I guarantee it. All decks, prepare for a hyperdrive. Look at him. It's a really cool idea to incorporate the pilot material into this. It's a really good idea. You sussed it out, Jim. Commodore, don't you think that... What? what you now seem to hear, Captain Kirk, are my thought transmissions. The Commodore was never aboard your vessel. His presence there and in the shuttlecraft was an illusion. Mr. Spock had related to us your strength of will. Captain Pike is welcome to spend the rest of his life with us, unfettered by his physical body. The decision is yours and his oh wow so that's how far their shit works like seven days at warp away even if regulations are explicit you could have come to me and explain ask you to face the death penalty too one of us was enough captain <sighs> one of us was enough it wasn't that he didn't trust you jim he didn't want to get you in trouble Message from starbase 11 sir received images from talus 4 in view of historic importance of Captain Pike and space exploration, General Order 7 prohibiting contact Talus 4 is suspended this occasion. No action contemplated against Spock. Proceed Amazing. as you think best. Signed, Mendez, J.I., Commodore, Starbase 11. Commodore Mendez coming through with the official word. Chris, do you want to go there? Oh, of course he does. It's the only way for him to get back. Please come back and see me. I want to talk to you. This regrettable tendency you've been showing lately towards flagrant emotionalism. I see no reason to insult me, sir. I believe I've been completely logical about the whole affair. Logically, it was the only way to help his friend. The only way. Someone he spent 11 plus years with. Yeah, I knew they were going to use that shot. 
I knew it. Robert Butler. I think he was the original director of The Cage. I wonder if they just added him in there because of the so much of The Cage was put in. Captain Pike has an illusion, and you have reality. May you find your way as pleasant. That was a weird outro credit sequence, too. All right, my friends. We just got finished Star Trek, the original series. Season 1, Episode 12, The Menagerie Part 2. And friends, there's only really one thing left to do, and that is to talk about it. All right, friends, just got done watching Star Trek, the original series, Season 1, Episode 12, The Menagerie Part 2. I'm finding it difficult to... I think the main thing about The Menagerie Part 1 and 2 is this. I am going to have to do an extensive bit of research here. Not extensive. I mean, my God, I'm not, you know discovering you know a new form of uh, mold or something um what i need to figure out though is i need to go in here and see exactly which scenes have they've changed for instance the scene with inside when when uh number one and the yeoman first come down as you know here's your selection of females um that that whole sequence was different several of vena's lines were different i don't know if they were added in afterwards like they had her come the actress come back in and like re-record some lines um or these were outtakes that we didn't see or i didn't see in the the whatever version or the edit of the cage that they've put up for like mass consumption um but there was a lot different there was a lot uh, way more exposition like the orion slave girl thing was longer um, you know, just a, a way more uh, conversations, like the, the phasers being placed and then several, you know, a time lapse before the Telosian comes in and gets grabbed. A lot of very different things, a lot of very different things. And that I think is the most fascinating part about this is we've looked at the cage. So really the menagerie is nothing more than an observation of the events of the cage, albeit this time we're given way more to understand, way more explanation for certain things. In fact, um, and I'm going to reserve judgment too much, but I think that the cut that we saw in the menagerie was the stronger cut than the one that we were given for the cage. I'm guessing there was a time constraint there. There seemed to be a lot of like, I'm going to just have to go back and take a look at it. But um, it told us a lot about the Telosians in that their power is way more... Uh, advanced or way more blanketing than what we thought. I mean, to be able to insert Commodore Mendez into the shuttle from all the way back at Starbase 11, which they said was seven days away at warp, that's a hell of a reach of those powers. Um, and a couple questions that I have going forward now is obviously the Telosians have at least... Uh, at least the Telosians have the capacity for compassion. And it looks like they were genuinely like sympathetic or empathetic towards the plight that Christopher was in. Because they were able to, you know, they readily accepted him back. They were the ones that initiated communications. Well, not initiated, or responded or whatever to what Spock had said. He opened up a space for them on Talos 4, uh, presumably with Vina and Pike here. Here's my question. So the illusions are present. The biology is present in that though their forms are shattered, Vina and Pike are both on Talos. So... They're both there, but they appear young to one another. You know, obviously Pike's able to move around. His mind is fine. So now with that added, you know, ability of the Telosians to have that that that, that tangible illusion quality, um, he basically has a life on Talos IV. I'm going to continue by saying this. This opens a lot of things for me. And I think this would open a lot of things for a future series like A Strange New Worlds or like A Discovery. You have several dangling threads here, and I don't know if we get this addressed anymore in the original series, but if the Telosians can reach seven days away at warp, as far as that's the, the guy that we're going, they can, we, they, we know they can reach at least that far away. What is to say that they couldn't gift Pike with the ability to, you know, even though his body shattered, he could appear like the old Pike talk, converse, live a life, because like they said, his mind's fine, his body shattered. If they could do that, then, you know, with their range being what it is, isn't there a way to, like, actually put Chris back out there? At the very least, he could, like, work as an ambassador for the Telosians or, or negotiate with Starfleet in the future. How long will the Telosians let Vina and Pike live, you know? 
is it a limit to their biology or is it something that telosians and their medicine and everything can do to keep them alive for a longer period of time? Finally, I'll say this, is it something that can they, can Vena and Pike have kids? Now, obviously advanced years of both, you know, Vena is only 13 years, I mean, she's 13 years older than she was as the old kind of shattered woman, older shattered woman that we saw after the illusion was removed. Pike's 13 years older. I don't know. I don't know how any of that works. I'm just saying that if somebody wanted to, there's a lot of story left on Talos 4, a ton of story left on Talos 4. I'm very, very curious about that. And the other thing I think is the big takeaway from all of this is the interpersonal relationship building between the big three. Um, we didn't see much of Bones at all, I think, in the uh, Menagerie Part 2. But in the Menagerie Part 1, Bones was adamant that... This is Spock. We have to trust Spock. Spock is going to, Spock, we've, you, you know, he took Spock's side. Now, albeit, you know, he was under the impression that Spock had nothing to do with it. But this was Bones. Bones is, he doesn't need an excuse to butt heads with Spock. On any given argument, any given item, any given moment, he can butt heads with Spock. But when the push came, when it was really a big trop, big deal, Bones came to his defense, which I love. And that is... I don't care how you cut it, that is definitely a, a, a developer in a relationship. You know, Spock isn't present. He's not doing it for, you know, Spock's acceptance. Spock sees him sticking up for him. It has nothing to do with that. He does it in a vacuum. Just he and Jim, and he's able to, like, well, I mean, you got the, I mean, the conversation between the two of them. And that's great. That's really, really solid, really, really great shit uh, put in there. And of course, the bond between Kirk and Spock is only strengthened by this. Now, Kirk can always say, you know, why didn't you just tell me? If you told me, we wouldn't have a problem here. Understandable, though, you know, even with the illusory Commodore Mendez, he, he stated it. Kirk, this is your ship. You're held responsible for everything that goes on. Your career's over. You know, that's what would have happened, especially if because Spock would have had to have known that if he had come to Kirk and said, listen, the Telosians are contacting me. They can give Christopher at least some measure of life. Kirk, in all likelihood, would have been like, OK, let's do it. Uh, that means we have to break orders and blah, blah, blah. Kirk probably would have went along with it. And thus he would have been exposed to any type of court-martial regulations, prosecution and punishment, you know, um, and Spock wanted to spare him that. That was, Spock's logic was, I'm not saying it to you because I don't trust you. I'm saying it to you because I trust I know what you'll do. And so if I keep it silent and keep the, the real motives absent from the conversation, I'm sheltering you. I'm insulating you from any of the problems that might pop up, you know, problems like, you know, death penalty and shit like that. Which leads me to my final thought on all of this. Why was it a death penalty? Like, was it just considered so that the Telosians were so strong that they couldn't afford to lose a ship or you can't, you know, they could enslave you? Um, you know, it, it, the possibility exists that we just need to leave that sector alone. I get that. I get the under, the idea or the, you know, let's just, you know, put some buoys up. Let's make sure that nobody beacons up. Let's make sure that nobody knows to go in here. You know, it's understood. Talos star system's off limits. You cannot go out there. But then to make it a death penalty, which in and of itself, here, okay, here's my point. If you were, if you're Starfleet and you say, Hey, listen, for reasons that you don't need to know, Talos four or Talos star system, specifically Talos four is extremely and exceptionally dangerous. Stay away from it. I think that carries more weight and less of an interest peaking moment than if you say the same thing, Talos star systems off limits, Talos four, especially if you go in there, you will be killed under the death penalty, which is such a rare thing for Starfleet. If anything, someone's might think more. Why, why of all the places to get a death penalty, Talos four. And it goes from being just a place we don't go to, to a place of interest. Why don't we go there? I don't know. That's just me. But anywho, my friends, uh, if you stuck with me this long, please hit that like button, smash that subscribe, ring that bell for notifications, and you'll be alerted anytime we go live with any Star Trek or science fiction related material. And of course, if you want it early, 
link to Patreons in the description. So it's time now for us to go over to Q&A, and I think what I'm going to do with Q&A is obviously both parts one and two of the menagerie, but I'm going to stay away from talking too much about the cage, uh, except where there are different dialogue options that have been provided. We'll talk definitely about that. But my friends, it's time for Q, so I'll see you over there. Greetings, mon capitans, and welcome to another installment of Q&A. My friends, an extra special Q&A today as we have not one, but two episodes to Q&A, and that is the Menagerie Part 1 and the Menagerie Part 2. First and foremost, let me address this. Throughout the reaction, especially in Part 2, I kept saying, is this different? Is this line change? Is this an added line? Is this a different, you know, a dialogue option? The answer is sort of. Instead of it being like a completely different edit or, you know, seeing lines that, that you know, had been edited out of the cage or vice versa, um, what it really was is a positioning – there was a perspective problem, and I was – I fell prey to it. In the perspective problem, I mean a lot of these lines or whatnot that I had expected to either come before or after the line that had caused me confusion – were being shown as either the Telosian's point of view through their little view screen or through the trial perspective where they were, you know, Kirk and, and the Commodore and everybody were watching in the trial the screen that was coming on. And so because of those different kind of perspective shifts, I think that's what I bought into. I bought into there being additional stuff. Now, with all of that being said, there were different cuts as they came in where dramatic pauses existed in the cage or the menagerie or vice, you know, vice versa. They were different in the other version. It's very subtle, you know, it, where there might have been a two beat pause for something. They go right into a response by one of the actors. And I'm sure that was cut for time. I'm sure because you the, the, the quicker responses are in the menagerie as opposed to the cage. The cage, I think they needed more time to tell the story and they had more freedom because it was you know they didn't have to make cuts nothing was coming out you know they could have a, a full-length copy of a pilot but with the menagerie they had a time constraint you know they had their their envelope uh story which was the wraparound trial of spock and then of course the the meat of it which was the elements from the cage that were brought in to show the adventures of pike Long story longer, nothing major was changed or added. It was just the delivery in which they gave us, like, the length of the scene. Um, like, the Orion Slave Girl was more, it, we just, we stayed on it a little bit longer as opposed to pulling back to the Telosian perspective. Very subtle things, but it was enough to throw me. <laughs> so I apologize if as you were watching the reaction, you're like, is this something different? Or if you did what I did and went back to check and realized there's nothing different, this guy has no idea who's talking about. You know, it's very, very subtle. But um, again, it was enough to, to throw me. That's all said and done. Uh, the episode in itself was fantastic. But let's go back to our normal format that we have as we identify five major components for the Q&A section. This is by no means inclusive to all of the trivia that exists for the Menagerie, just things that I felt were very interesting and could add to the experience for anybody that's uninformed like I am. Um, or, you know, you're just a, a, a like me, a casual sci-fi Star Trek fan that doesn't know some of the fascinating backstory that goes into a lot of these episodes. And when I mean fascinating, you all have provided me with some of the coolest bits of information I have ever received. Let's dive into what is this two-parter, and from what I understand, the only two-parter in the original series, which is kind of disappointing, but at the same time, it was a hell of a two-parter. My friends, the writers and directors, the credits that were given. Now, what they did was they had initially asked Robert Butler to come back and direct The Menagerie, but Robert Butler, uh, who directed The Cage, you just really didn't like the show and told Gene Roddenberry as much that, you know, he just, he didn't have, he didn't enjoy himself and he didn't like the premise. He's not a sci-fi guy. Apparently that's what he said. And so with all of those kind of, you know, marks against it, he did not return. So what they ended up doing was Roddenberry asked Mark Daniels, who was the, uh, he directed The Man Trap and The Naked Time, two of the, I would say, the stronger offerings. Now, with all that being said, Roddenberry is the writer for both elements. So when you see, you know, part one of The Menagerie, it says written by Gene Roddenberry, directed by Robert Butler, or Mark Daniels, I think, for part one. And then for part two, it says written by Roddenberry, directed by Robert Butler. Whichever way is the reversal, the only reason Butler's name appears is because of the direction that he provided for the cage, which was the majority of this episode. And so he gets that credit that he never really received for the cage since it went unaired. So we have 
co-directors, you know, one existing from the, the past footage that was shot with the cage and Robert Butler, and the person that was directing the the envelope or the the kind of the bracketing story of the trial was Mark Daniels. Both of them, you know, provided a fantastic story, and I, it's one of the rare instances where co-direction works. Again, it's a kind of a unique circumstance, but it worked very, very well, and the, the styles of the two didn't, you know, hinder one or the other. They played well together. Now with our guest stars, we have quite a few of them. Uh, Malachi Throne, or Thorn, or Throne, I think it's Throne. Um, fantastic, played uh, Commodore Jose Mendez. Now, the Commodore, I thought, was a great, great character. Very strong, a very necessary character for Star Trek as we stand so far because to this point, other than communications coming from outside of the Enterprise, Kirk, you know, Kirk's the final say in everything. You know, Kirk's the commander of the ship, blah, blah, blah. What he says ultimately goes. And he, I mean, he asks for help from the crew, but ultimately the decision on how to proceed lies with James T. But not in a situation where an out, you know, a, a member of Starfleet outranks him and is on ship. In addition to that, Pike outranked him as well, being a fleet captain as opposed to just a just a captain. I think that their rank is technically the same, but as a fleet captain, Pike, correct me if I'm wrong, naval people out there, um, I'm pretty sure that the fleet captain has a bit of seniority over the, the regular captain, um, although their designations, I believe, are represented the same in the Star Trek universe. From what I read, I could be really, really wrong about that, or I misread it, but that's, you know, regardless, we had uh, two other characters aboard ship that were either of greater or the same rank as Kirk, which added, I thought, a lot to the tension. James, you know, Jimmy can't get Spock out of this, you know, especially if he's 2v1 in a, a trial or, a, you know, a group of three here seeing exactly what his guilt is. Um, the other people that we had in there, and it, it, fake or not, the actor Malachi Throne played a fantastic role, and I so desperately wish that this character would come back again. I think this is this is the type of character that would have been a fantastic touchstone. I'm not talking every episode or somebody that constantly delivers orders to uh, the Enterprise. I just think that you know, once or twice a season touching base with the Commodore would be really, really great, but I don't think he shows up as the Commodore anymore. I might be wrong. Please correct me if I am. I didn't see any instances where it said that he reprised the role, though. So that's where I stand. Now, Sean Kinney is the one that played Pike in the chair, Pike with all the makeup on. Um, you know, he was made up to look, the, the actor himself looked a lot like uh, Jeffrey Hunter, who played Pike in the cage. Um, same type of facial features and whatnot, facial structure, I should say. But it took him five hours in the makeup chair to fix his role in the pike chair. Um, and what they did, too, is in the process of applying these prosthetics and things like that and the makeup that was placed on there, they were using the uh, uh, the headshot of Jeffrey Hunter as a reference. So they were trying the, everything they could to, you know, enhance the jawline and kind of contour the nose, anything they could to make him look just a little bit more like Pike, even though, or Pike, uh, like Jeffrey Hunter, even though that he was, you know, had been disfigured by the Delta Rays, it was something that they really tried to get as accurate as possible. And I think they did a hell of a good job, you know. Honestly, I think that you, just upon the eyeball test, you'd be like, yeah, is that the same guy? But if someone said, hey, yeah, that's Jeffrey Hunter, you'd be like, all right. You know, it, it wasn't so far gone that, you know, it took away from the story or anything like that. Um, Hansen was played by uh, Hagen Beggs, which I thought was a hell of a cool name. Um, and then we had, of course, Jeffrey Hunter uh, as just not reprising the role, but Jeffrey Hunter's clips from the cage as his portrayal, one and only portrayal of Christopher Pike, and Susan Oliver as the great Vena. Again, these from the cage. Neither of them returned to either offer voiceover work or additional footage, which I thought would have been really great, but I can completely understand why they didn't do it because it is a time and money problem. Um, also, I think Jeffrey Hunter couldn't come back. He didn't want to, but he couldn't either. He was already uh, engaged in another job. Now, of the core cast, the big three was there in Spock, McCoy, and Kirk, obviously. Um, we also had Scotty and Uhura, no Sulu in either Menagerie Part 1 or Menagerie Part 2. Now, uh, as far as the production, which is our fourth element of Q&A, 
really cool things to that happened in this one. We have mentioned that Sean Kinney spent five hours in the makeup chair to look not only like Christopher Pike, but Jeffrey Hunter, which I always thought was awesome. Um, again, Roddenberry wanted Butler to come back, but he just didn't like the show. And so Mark Daniels was brought in to do the envelope production of what was the trial and the revelation of the Commodore not really being there, which I thought was fantastic. Now, with all of that being said, Here's the thing that I thought was fascinating. Mark Daniels apparently had a big no-no when it came to television production, especially with Star Trek. He, as has been revealed to me, is the director of an episode, forthcoming episode called The Court Martial that was actually filmed before The Menagerie. During that production, he did the unthinkable and went a day over and I don't know what reason for, I didn't want to look too much into it, but he broke the schedule, which is a huge problem, especially with, with how like absolutely packed their schedule was to produce this show. So many episodes working with so many extras who were working on so many different productions. If you even get a half day behind, you are in a world of hurt because, you know, trying to get all these people... The actors were the biggest problems. I had no clue how many of these like co-stars and guest stars and things like that worked constantly. They would go from a Western to Twilight Zone to Star Trek to, you know, I mean, whatever was available at the time. But they moved around through the City of Angels constantly um, working on this. So if you had somebody that, you know, you were slated to have for a seven or six day period and you had to go over one day, well, hell, they're probably supposed to be over on Gunsmoke or something. And so off they went. Woo! So anywho, despite that, Mark Daniels was asked back by Gene Roddenberry to film The Menagerie. And Daniels, again, did the unthinkable. He was able to wrap production on his side of The Menagerie a day early to make up for the lost time, which I thought was baller because... Adding a day, hell, that's easy. <laughs> you know, you just F up. Or you have to, you know, need to retake and do things, which is effing up. Um, with this one, though, cutting a day of an actual established production, you could say, oh, well, there's not that much that's in the envelope episode of The Menagerie. Oh, there's quite a bit because you have different locales and you have Starbase 11 and you've got all these different things that you have to put in there. Plus, even though it's, oh, it's not that big a part of an episode, there's two episodes in there. And so his con contribution was very, very close to, you know, between both the size of a regular episode. And he cut it. He cut it down by a day. Hell of a job, Mr. Daniels. Hell of a job. And finally, for the production, this episode won the Hugo Award in 1967, which is a hell of an accomplishment, especially when you think of how creative the use of the footage from the cage actually was. You had this great stuff, this great story, these very good performances that were uh, left missing. And, you know, as many people explained after I posted uh, Menagerie Part 1, and I kind of tongue-in-cheek joked, I think somebody wanted a week off because they didn't have to film anything. I knew that there was the schedule was way more pressed than that. And so, you know, obviously, and you all uh, told me, this was because they were getting behind and they needed something to kind of get them a two-week jump or a two-cycle production jump, which is what the elements from the cage and the, 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 the video that was brought forward from that uh, and allowed them to do. But that's only half of it because done incorrectly or done in a, a poor fashion or with a poor type of premise, it could have come off very, very flat or at the very, you know, worse, confusing like very confusing. Like the audience would go, I don't even know what the hell I'm watching and I'm out. And that would have been devastating for the series at that point. However, in doing it in such a way as to elicit the idea that there is so much more to this series than anybody knows, here is an element of the past that is filmed different uniforms. There's Spock, what's going on? So many questions. And it was done so expertly as to weave in a wounded Christopher Pike and still make the story of the Telosians um, 
It's so incredibly important to the mythos of Star Trek and providing such a great sci-fi hook, you know, bringing somebody out of their, 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 their crippled body and putting them back into at least the illusory semblance of being themselves. It was, it's, it's fascinating, and it was done in such a, a great way um, with both the new cast in Kirk and McCoy and everybody like that, and the old cast with Jeffrey Hunter and with Susan Oliver and everybody playing just a hell of a great role um, and learning more about the Enterprise's past, which is it was, was really what it was all about. It was to create that kind of familiarity and legacy without there really being one. Love it. Great, great stuff. And I think that the, the, the biggest, the biggest feather in the cap of the menagerie is this. When it came time for syndication cuts, None were ordered. And my friends, that pretty much says it all for the Menagerie 1 and 2. As any affiliate that ordered the series and saw the episodes said, we'll make it work. <laughs> we don't need any cuts. This rocks. And my friends, so ends another installment of Q&A. Until we meet again, mon capitans. Behave yourselves. <laughs>